Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the program. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Homo erectus, uh, the oldest allegedly Homo erectus skull found to date now. I think the previous oldest was about 1.8 to 1.9 million years ago around the Caucasus Mountains. And then that there was another one that I think the the age was disputed that was about 2.1 million years ago, and that was around uh, around Israel, Syria area. Um, but then that was heavily disputed, and I don't think that was fully accepted, as, at least into the mainstream. But this one found in South Africa is really, really interesting. Um, and so we're going to talk about that and a little bit of the area that it was found in. The, the title of this article reads, Earliest Known Skull of Homo Erectus Unearthed by Australian-Led Team. Uh, the fossil shows the first of our ancestors existed up to 200,000 years earlier than previously thought, researchers say. Again, this is a, this is huge. Obviously, um, actually, the uh, there was some confusion uh, found earlier on because they uh, allegedly they found a piece, a fragment of the same skull, a few years earlier, and they thought that it was a baboon, a fragment of a baboon skull. And then once they found other pieces and started piecing it together, which in and of itself is a huge painstaking uh, process because you, it's really delicate material material you're working with and um, also every time that they try to uh, piece stuff together there's a huge risk that things become uh, denatured I guess like damaged in the process so the fact that they're able to do this is a, is a huge deal and this is what they are able to piece together and um, there's some uh, guide uh, guided lines here to give you a and it, uh, just a visual of what the brain case uh, would have looked like if it was complete. So again, this is a huge chunk, and it's very interesting that uh, it comes from the Germelin main quarry, which uh, is in South Africa, about 25 miles north of Johannesburg. So it's around here, this complex here. So you see Johannesburg down here. So it's just this entire area uh, around here. So. Uh, this is a picture of the actual quarry site, and they call it the quarry, but really what it is, is it's like a single large cavern, essentially, which is part of this larger uh, Dremelin uh, Paleo Cave complex. Um, so the site itself, the, the complex itself, was discovered in 1994 by Andre Kaiser, and some other notable discoveries that they found, which we'll talk about uh, later on in this video... Uh, where it was Paranthropus robustus, which is basically uh, another way of saying um, the robust version of Australopithecus, uh, just because I think they had a thicker uh, uh, brow, and there are just uh, certain things about its uh, bone structure that um, would lead one to to aptly describe it as a robust version of uh, of Lucy, essentially, and Lucy again being the Astra Australopithecus, which in and of itself is a species distantly related to us, allegedly. Some people dispute that uh, Australopithecus even exists, um, but that's a whole other video. Um, some other stuff that they found here was a male mandible called Orpheus, or also known as DNH8 which was found adjacent to uh, Paranthropus robustus, uh, also known as DNH7. So this th this area, again, is not... Uh, it's been around for uh, almost 30 years, and they know for sure that there was activity here. Um, so the DMQ, or the main quarry site, w is dated to 2.04 to 1.95 million years ago. And the, um, how they dated this was through uranium lead dating and uh, uranium series electron spin resonance dating, and a little bit of paleomagnetism as well, which is uh, um, has a lot to do with the the geology of the site and measuring things through uh, um, the mineral uh, minerals and stuff found in the layers. Um, another notable nearby site. Again, I just want to give you guys a, a basic background before we actually go into this. Um, is about 160 feet away, called the Dremelin Macondo, or the DMK. And that's dated to 2.61 million years ago, although they haven't found any hominin remains there. So this is a DNH7 that they found that I uh, uh, talked about earlier, the Paranthropus robustus. Um, and this is a DMK, the, the nearby site. 
um, that's 2.61 million years ago, allegedly. And how they got to that date um, was uh, they measured the speleothem in the in the ca cave, which basically uh, they're mineral deposits found usually in limestone. So you can uh, limestone is or, uh, formed partially by organic material. So you could uh, date it through there. And um, there's also things called flow stones. So here's a nice visual of what I'm talking about. So you have columns, you have stalact uh, stalagmites and stalactites. Those are the classic um, um, versions of sp uh, speli speleothems. And then there's the flow stones here. And the flow stones are uh, basically how they uh, 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 dated the site to 2.61 million years ago. Um, and the site itself is a lot different from the DMQ site. The DMQ site, like I mentioned before, is one a single large cavern but this, uh, the DMK, is a series of interconnecting maze-like passages, which is, uh, again, very interesting that all of these are found clustered, pretty much clustered together, these, these uh, sites here. So anyway, I'm done burying the lead, so let's get into the actual article. So um, the skull was pieced together from more than 150 fragments uncovered at the DMQ. And again, I, uh, here's, a, here's a picture of that again. So I mentioned before, it's a very uh, painstaking uh, process. And uh, the guy who found it, uh, gosh, I got to give this guy credit. Um, uh, not, not, An not Andy Harry's, but there's another guy who found it. Um, there's a name for that. I, I just don't have, oh, Richard Curtis. There we go. Uh, Richard Curtis found uh, the, the initial fragment in 2015. And then from there, they just uh, uh, built it. Um, so, so what, um, Harry says again at this, it's a, it, the brain case again is belong to a juvenile. So around two to three years old, um, this is extraordinary because at that age, as if you have kids, you, you'll know, or, you know, we were all babies. I, I think it's pretty common knowledge that babies have soft bones. So, um, to have one, a, a deceased uh, juvenile uh, to be preserved in this way is again very uh, extraordinary um, and it's susceptible to damage so it's crazy that they they survived that long the group this two or three year old was a part of could have been the origin of everyone alive today and the reason why they say that is because they believe it does belong to homo erectus and if i uh, just zoom out homo erectus if you got i'm sure a lot of you guys know about it but just really quick they're the most ubiquitous ancient hominin that we found in the fossil record and they found them everywhere they found them in china they found them in the caucasus mountains in the middle east um uh, uh eastern and, and southern africa uh and also uh, indonesia as well so uh they believe that that they were the root one of the it's not depending on who you ask but t typically the mainstream believes that homo erectus was the root of where um, other branches of, of later uh, uh, humans, including modern humans, came from. And again, this all was going down two million years ago. They were active all the way up until uh, the most recent Homo erectus that they found was in Indonesia, and that's about 120 to 100,000 uh, years ago. Um, so they've been around and prospering for a while. Um, so Curtis, when he found it, he originally thought he had discovered the skull pieces of a baboon, just because uh, they find a lot of uh, baboons in the area and they find um, a lot of uh, remnants of, of baboon communities and stuff. So they, luckily he didn't just throw it out or anything. And then later on they go back and then he cleans off the fragments and then they start uh, seeing the peculiarities of it. And one of the most glaring uh, details that they couldn't wrap their head around was the fact that the skull was way too big and round to be a baboon and again it took them five years to put 150 plus pieces together that's a long time that's a that's that's like a the hardest jigsaw puzzle times a million uh in terms of difficulty just because you you only have so much uh the, you know you're dealing with puzzle pieces with limited durability right so you have to be very careful you need to have sur surgeon like precision to pull this off um, 
So uh, anyway, moving on, the fragment was placed in a bag and sat in a vault for about a decade until Harry's team realized it was a piece of their skull, which he named DMH-134. Um, so yeah, there was another piece of the skull that they found in 2007, but again, they didn't know, they didn't really know what to make of it. There was no nothing matching about it. So I think that that's really interesting as well. Uh, from 2007 to a full eight years before they find, you know, another fragment from the same skull. Uh, that's a really miraculous discovery. Um, we can say Homo erectus shared the landscape with two other types of humans in, the, in South Africa, and that goes back to um, DNH7 and DNH8 that they found in the main, uh, not the not the main quarry, but then the the paleo complex, the entire paleo complex. Um, and again, this suggests that one of these other human species, Australopithecus sediba. Uh, may have not been the direct answer of Homo erectus or us. They might have been a completely different offshoot. Why? Because they they were probably living amongst each other. So who was Australopithecus, right? If they're not our direct ancestor, um, that there's a lot of questioning uh, questions there. And if you look at the skull and some of the recreations of Australopithecus, it obviously does look like some sort of um, more typical primate, like a gorilla or a or uh, some sort of ape, so, so some sort of great ape. Um, so, or, and some people even dispute if this is even real. I don't really go down that road because no, I can't really prove either way. But it, it is interesting to note that a lot of people call bullshit on, on the Australopithecus itself, like completely. Um, but either way, the, it seems to be smoking gun here that they were found uh, living very close to each other and perhaps even uh, co coexisted with each other. Harry said the finding was particularly special because in 1924, the Australian anatomist Raymond Dart identified the first fossil ever found in Australopithecus africanus, an extinct hom hominin closely related to humans in uh, discovered in South Africa. Nobody believed him at the time because they thought the origin of humans would be in Europe. And then, yeah, we talked about that in previous episodes. There's, there's all kinds of biases there. And a hundred years later, DMH-134 will sit in the same room as the same uh, child he identified in the 1920s, uh, further proving what he found is the work of Australians on human evolution. Uh, for sure, that is the case. He said, made a good case for Homo erectus and several more species of hominin and other animals emerging at the time of a drying climate 2.3 to 2 million years ago. And that's, uh, that's very interesting to note. Um, at the time, I don't have the, a map back then. I'm not going to pull it up right now. Um, when Africa was once upon a time, not only was there a green Sahara, but a lot of, uh, uh, Africa was heavily forested, right? Um, that's why, uh, there was a hypothesis that humans came down from the trees and then they came down and once they developed, uh, bipedalism and all that stuff, um, they were able to see further in the distance. They had depth perception. There's a lot of stuff going on. The opposable thumb around all this time, um, the grasslands started to uh, emerge, right? Or the, the, the rather, the these uh, forested areas were starting to recede into uh, um, into grassland because the climate was drying out. Um, if you guys are familiar with Terence McKenna, Terence McKenna has the stoned ape theory, which he believes around that the time that the savannas were co uh, coming uh, emerging that people had to, uh, they were eating mushrooms and then they started cooperating and then it, it ended up uh, affecting their evolution. Anyway, it's a very interesting theory, but again, I stress that it's just a theory, okay? I'm not saying that it's truth. I'm just letting you know that that piece of evidence about um, Terence McKenna is relevant to what we're describing here or what is being described here. And, and at the time, again, 2.3, to two million years ago, according to um, all of all of this new evidence, it seems like Homo erectus was living uh, with Australopithecus, and that has to. Now we have to call into question what was going on at the time. Maybe uh, their coexistence uh, wasn't. Uh, I guess maybe they weren't on friendly terms after a while. Maybe Homo erectus, if we are to believe that they are, are one of our direct descendants. Like our lineage traces directly uh, to them, then I think it, it it's safe to say that perhaps there's a chance that Homo erectus exterminated them, or there was some sort of conflict, or maybe they just got 
they're just too smart and they ended up just occupying all the land and and um marginalizing all the other um coexisting hominin that could definitely uh be uh be a possibility um, he, uh, Shipton goes on to say, this fits with the idea of our genus being adapted to the savanna, and in particular exploiting the big game that is available on grasslands, which they would then butcher using stone tools, um, which makes sense. Right? That's an interesting scenario. But I think the big, the big thing to take away is when the savannas rose and the forested regions started receding, that's definitely when humans started to uh, proliferate and they found their niche pretty much in the, in the food chain anyway. And that allowed them to thrive and then evolve and leave all of these remains that we're studying now. This, this find is a long way from the previous earliest Homo erectus in East Africa, confirming Homo erectus was wide ranging from the outset. So it seems like the history of Homo erectus, the oldest one, it seems to be that they were all, they were, by the time that we found the oldest fossil, in other words, um, they were already everywhere. They were wide ranging from the get go. So that's, that's a huge conundrum in and of itself. Um, their early fossils have also been found in Georgia, so around the Caucasus, like I said, 1.8 million years ago, and they likely reached the island of Flores, where they became isolated and evolved in the Humboldt Forest Sciences. I have, a, I have a, 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 an episode about this specifically where they, um, they ran these computer simulations and they found out that it would only take about uh, a, a, an, a, there was a limited amount, like the, the minimum amount of generations for them to morph from from these larger hominins, these, I guess you would call shambling, or some people would describe them as shambling. I don't know how you would come to that conclusion, but no doubt bigger than uh, Homo floresiensis. And then that whole process for, for them to morph from, into this dwarf-like species is a lot shorter than you would think. I think it's a, it comes out to be like 10,000 years or something like that. So it's very interesting. Um, I totally would uh, recommend that video if you're interested. Um, so a geochronologist and a quaternary scientist not involved in the study uh, said, um, research into human evolution is increasingly uncovering overlaps between different hominids thought to be separated spatially and tem temporally. So these well-dated overlaps indicate that the hominid family tree is much more diverse and complex than previously accepted. Um, there's the most fascinating in, in, uh, implication from this is the cause of Australopithecus extinction. And it, it could be explored with the new potential that there may have been competition from both Homo or Paranthropus. And again, yeah, maybe there's a lot more to the story now. Um, maybe they were at odds with each other. Maybe they were living together. And um, they, uh, I guess, just... It, the, the smarter species will win, I guess. And it, maybe it's not malevolent. Maybe it's just an organic thing. Maybe um, they eventually got absorbed into the population or or if they weren't viable, they just got marginalized. And that's just what happens, right? Um, but anyway, what, what do you guys think about that uh, in light of this overlap, this species overlap? Um, what do you guys think? What's the story now? Um, they were living really, really close together. What do you think the communities were like? Um, let me know in the comments. Um, I would I would really like to hear all your guys' opinion. Um, another thing, uh, another unrelated uh, note is uh, I talked about Owen Yaris on here. Uh, he's a live science contributor, and I've t I've done a lot of his articles, and he's a very well researched um, um, guy, and he's uh, very uh, I've talked to him on Twitter and we've retweet, retweeted each other's stuff uh, back and forth for the better part of, I guess, a year and a half now. Um, but he just got done doing an interview with someone and um, I reached out to him and now we're, he's going to come on the broadcast on Friday. And for the first hour, at least, uh, maybe we might go into the uh, second hour. Depends. It, it will be uninterrupted breaks. Um, I'm just going to do the whole interview start to finish. But please turn in at 1 p.m. Friday. Uh, you don't want to miss this. I think Owen's really interesting and I would love to pick his brain just about uh, like how we got into this subject matter and um, what's keeping him in, in this uh, subject and, and what his process is, his research process and all that stuff and his background and all that. Anyway, um, yeah, so just leave the comment about Australopithecus and all of this stuff, the age of Erectus and um, yeah, and I'll see you guys on Friday.